Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is It's Ben. And today we're going to be taking a look at a house that is so bad that it's the reason there was no video last week. We filled two 30-yard dumpsters completely full with clothing, candles, Christmas decorations, and without exaggeration, about 50,000 magazines. We'll get into all that later. Right now, I wanted to talk about how this house got into this condition and what we're dealing with, because this is completely different from every other hoarder house that I've done on the channel. About a year ago, a guy contacted me from a town that's about an hour and 45 minutes away from me. And he explained that his mother had some problems and that right around COVID or just before, she had moved out of her house and into the town that he lives in. But she hadn't gone back to that house since she moved. He said it was bad enough that you couldn't open the back door and that he had trouble walking through it. Now, I agreed to take a look, but whenever he spoke to his mother, she wasn't ready for that to happen. Even though she didn't live there anymore, the idea of somebody going through her stuff and cleaning it up scared her, which happens a lot with hoarders. Remember that with hoarding disorder, this is a neuropsychological disorder. This is not about the stuff. This is about a misfire in the brain that connects that stuff to an intense emotional reaction. There's a physical problem with the brain that creates a psychological response. So throwing away stuff from this house would be the same as somebody throwing away her pets or an extreme extreme cases, her children. So we put it off. About a year later, he contacted me again and said, I think she's finally ready to go through this house and get it cleaned up. It's been three or four years since she's lived in it. I think she's finally ready to move on. So I have him meet me at the house and we start going through things and it, it's pretty bad. I mean, as you're seeing in these pictures and, and in this cleanup, it, it's pretty bad. When we get to the bedrooms, it'll blow your mind. So I start talking to him about the possible consequences of cleaning this up and where it can leave her psychologically. And then he looks at me with that look that kind of says, oh, you didn't know, or I forgot to tell you. It turns out that his mother had passed away after midnight that day. So this suddenly turned from a hoarder cleanup into a hoarder clear out. And that changes everything. If you're doing a cleanup for a hoarder who still lives in the house, you're going to do it one room at a time, or at least I do. I'll do all the kitchen to its completion, then all the dining room, then the living room, and I'll just work my way around the house until everything is done. However, in those cases, you oftentimes can't throw a ton of stuff away. Or even if you do throw away a full dumpster of stuff, it's still too much left in the house. There's a lot of compromise that happens there. However, in a case where the hoarder no longer lives in the house or they've passed away or they've just been evicted, then it's a case of collecting memorabilia, things with emotional value, pictures, birth certificates, things like that. Major items that can be saved like furniture, furniture and appliances, things that have genuine monetary value so they can be auctioned off, then everything that's left after those will either be donated or trashed. Now I have a full video on why certain cleaners don't donate items and I implore you to watch that after this, but I bring it up because nothing could be donated from this house. Every square inch of it was covered in roach feces, mouse and rat feces and urine, fly vomit and rot. Everything was unused. Usable. Anything that was usable or able to be cleaned up, we actually kept. The things that we picked up were in such bad condition that we actually called the one place that we have here in town that takes donations and warned them that there were going to be some dumpster divers bringing a massive amount of stuff over to be donated. Then we explained the condition of the house and they appreciated the heads up because they know as well as we do, all of that stuff has to be thrown away. Jason, my oldest son, was the one who called them and I'm glad that he did because even though those people have the best of intentions, what they're actually doing is putting themselves in danger by getting into a dumpster that we're filling up with broken glass and feces of every kind. Then they're moving 10 hours worth of work that we just did into someone else's donation box and forcing them to then redo all that work to throw it away in their dumpster. Then it just makes this huge problem where I have to fight the person at the thrift store. Then to stop it, they have to call in the military and it's just a huge, huge pain. So I would prefer that dumpster divers just stay out of the dumpster and let us do our job. Now the situation actually changes the way we clean the house. So I mentioned earlier how we do it one room at a time if somebody lived there. Since nobody lives here, we can do this in larger steps. The easiest way to do this is to go through every room and get rid of everything that we know is going to go in the dumpster. All the trash, broken dishes, things that are covered in feces, 
reason could be considered a biohazard or at least a borderline biohazard. These are things that if someone gave them to me as a gift, the second they left the room, I'd throw them in the trash. That's kind of the rule of thumb here. Obviously, if somebody gave me a baseball card that was worth five grand and it just had some roach poop on it, I would end up having that restored and cleaned. If they gave me a set of pans or dishes that were covered in mouse crap and roach crap, there's not a chance I'm cleaning those up. And I don't think anybody else should have to be forced to do that either. It's like, hey dude, here's some dishes I pulled out of the sewer. You can thank me later. Charity. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going through every room and unhoarding and detrashing this whole house. And this takes a long time because just like with all other hoarder houses, you can't just shovel this stuff up and throw it away. There are legitimately valuable items underneath all this trash. I found pictures from the late 1800s, expensive watches. I found a Gucci bag and a Chanel bag, an original Merlin handheld game from 1978 with the original box and original instruction manual in mint condition. That by itself can sell for as much as like 300 bucks at an antique toy auction, but we'll go over all the crazy stuff I found here in just a bit. Mostly this house was filled with an overload of clothing, magazines, dishes, Christmas decorations, and individually clipped out recipes from magazines and books. I found, and I'm not joking here, at least a hundred thousand individually clipped out recipes. Every time I found another Ziploc bag or Walmart bag filled with those, I said some words that I won't repeat on this narration. It didn't just make me frustrated. It actually scared me because this was on the obsessive level that can get a person committed. The laundry room was filled with a bunch of food and booze. There was a lot of hidden booze in the house, clothing, and just straight up trash. Some of the more interesting things I found in here was a box of jello pudding that expired in 2013, which means it was probably made in 2011. So you're talking about 13 years that thing's been sitting in that cabinet. I found a lot of brand new cookware and appliances that would have been good at one point, but the roaches and mice had gotten into the boxes, so most of those had to be tossed. Inside of a giant green cabinet or two sets of cabinets, I found a whole bunch of dishes that are potentially worth some money, including Tupperware, original Tupperware from like the 60s or 70s, and some massive pots that, man, you could make some chili in those suckers. Some like man chili. Man chili. But underneath all this were dozens and dozens of mouse nests. That's what all the shredded paper is all over the floor. When I moved into the living room, I always kind of focus on something that would bring me satisfaction in seeing clean. The thing that annoys me the most in a room, that's what I want to fix first because it feels like accomplishment. And in this room, it was this massive TV stand with an old flat screen CRT TV. The TV was so big that the stand was built to be adjustable and go around it. It's not sitting on a stand. It's actually sitting on its own speakers. It's a part of this massive Sony TV. But all the little knickknacks and stuff that are around it in that case, I wanted to go through those because typically on a TV stand with a lot of shelves, that's where you're going to get car keys, house keys, jewelry, and just a lot of extra knickknacks that may be worth something. Because as the person walks into the house from a trip to the grocery store or a night out or whatever, whatever they happen to have in their hand, they'll just sit on one of those shelves. And that's what I found here. Some watches. I found like 50 TV remotes, dozens and dozens of candles. In fact, 
back. By the time we were done with this house, we had thrown away probably 5,000 candles. Now I've got that Chris Pratt song stuck in my head. And then again, magazines everywhere. Most of the knickknacks on the TV stand were just cheap and tossable, but there were a few that looked like they had legitimate actual value. So what I did was I tossed the cheap ones and I kept all the expensive ones and the high quality ones to be used as decoration after we cleaned the house. I found so many pictures that we filled three Rubbermaid tubs. And the craziest part of it to me is that's where we found the pictures from the late 1800s. Tons of pictures from the 1940s and 50s. All original. We found a couple pictures from like the Wild Wild West era and they were all just sitting under piles and piles of garbage. But that's why you find in these houses. It's why I don't like it when people take shovels to hoarding houses. Unless everything is so completely demolished that it's like all the materials wet and it's like a literal dump. Then I'd say shovel it all up because you're not saving anything. And those houses do exist. I've cleaned some of those houses. But in this particular house, the amount of valuables versus the amount of ruined garbage was enough that I felt like it was smart and respectful to go through everything. So people ask me a lot, how do I know what to throw away and what to keep? And the answer is, for the most part, common sense. You'll find a lot of stuff that's obvious garbage and it just has to go. But when you do this line of work, you actually have to be at least a little bit versed in antiques. So I'm a bit educated on what dishes are worth money versus what is just a dollar garage sale nothing. I know what Pyrex from the 1960s looks like, for instance. I know that a snowflake casserole dish that's two quart that is original Pyrex can go for like two to three hundred dollars. I also know that new Pyrex that still has a price tag on the bottom is not. They're made differently. They're a dime a dozen. They're not worth saving, especially when they're covered in roach crap. I also know that a 1995 Merlot is worth keeping, which we did find in this house. A bottle of peppermint schnapps is not. Clothes that still have the tags on them from like Kohl's and Walmart, fine, toss them if they're ruined. A wedding dress from 1959, keep that sucker. In fact, put it on, clean with it. You'll be all fancy. You also become somewhat skilled in going through paperwork very rapidly. You are able to pick out bills from important documents just at a glance. And that just comes with practice. She kept every Christmas card she had ever gotten, every bill that came to her house, every piece of junk mail she ever got. We filled half of a dumpster with nothing but junk mail, Christmas cards, magazines, and recipe clippings. People who watch my channel regularly know that I have an immense amount of empathy for people with hoarding disorder because it can't be helped any more than your depression can just be helped by smiling more. You know, people are like, I would have just thrown all that stuff away. Or why don't you just explain to them that they could be using that money for better things? And it's like telling somebody with depression, man, you could be so much happier if you just didn't have depression. It's a genuine neuropsychological disorder. Study it. It is fascinating. But I still have a problem because I'm human. So it's really frustrating to me as I'm going through this stuff to know that now that she's gone, this is her son's inheritance. He didn't get a gift. He didn't get a priceless set of memories for him to cherish. He got an expense. He got a garbage dump handed to him. Now, what I do is not a service. You can't like look up on Google and find people who clean houses for free. People like me are very rare. I'm autistic. I do this for fun because I'm weird. And I do it to help people who can't help themselves. Had I not come over here to do this for him, this would have cost him around $15,000 to clean up. I personally spent $3,000 dollars on this cleanup out of my own pocket. I rented two 30 yard dumpsters, which are about $1,500 to $1,600 on their own. And I paid another $1,500 in labor to have my son, Jason, my daughter, Adrian, and my employee, Daniel, all three are employees, but to have them come over to help me with this cleanup, add in all the extra trash bags and cleaning equipment and chemicals and the rags and brooms and mops that we just had to throw away after because they were ruined. And all that adds up to about three grand. Now, I'm not complaining about that. I'm fine with it. I get a cool video. I get to have fun. People get to be entertained by watching this chaos turn into order. And this dude gets helped out in ways that didn't exist before we came along. But had I not had this weird hobby that I like to do, and had I not been able to afford to pay for those things, this would have all been coming out of the pocket of the guy who had inherited the house. So even if he was cleaning it up on his own, he still would have had to pay 
pay that much in dumpster fees and all the stuff I just listed. And then because he doesn't know what he's doing, it would have taken him at least a month to clean this up. We, we did it in six or seven days. That bothers me not because the woman didn't think of that before she passed. It frightens me because she didn't have the ability to think of that before she passed. And knowing that any of us with just the right brain chemistry and just the right amount of trauma, because this is always triggered by massive trauma, like a death in the family or a bitter divorce or a loss of a career or a terrible accident, any of us could be in this situation. And even if we're not personally in this situation, any of our relatives could be as well. Any of your friends could find themselves in this predicament. And when you do find yourself buried under several tons of rubble, the worse it gets, the more difficult it gets to ask for help. Your house goes to hell because when things break, you can't find a, a repairman who can actually get back to the, the thing that needs to be fixed. So most of these places have bad plumbing. This one was no exception. They couldn't turn on the hot water because all the hot water pipes had leaks in them. They couldn't turn on the heat because all the vents were stuffed full of mouse nests. Every door and window in this entire house needed to be replaced, but they couldn't because no one could get to the doors or the windows to replace them. If you ever have a friend who you meet to go get lunch or whatever, you, you want to go out to bingo or a break dance battle or a, like a pole dancing competition, and they never let you inside, they always meet you out on their deck or their front porch, and then you notice, man, it's been years since I've been inside their house. It's almost a certainty that they have hoarding disorder. There is a very good chance that their house looks like the one you're seeing here. That's actually a super common sign of hoarding disorder. Now, keep in mind, we're not throwing away all this stuff that you see us picking up and putting into tubs. There's a lot of it that we're sorting out and putting together. So certain types of glassware, things that are still sealed in boxes, stoneware vases, things that actually have value, whether they be monetary or decorative or sentimental value. Because once we get all this trash out of here, then we're actually going to clean this house. And once we clean it, we'll be able to do something we've never been able to do in another hoarder house video on this channel ever, which is we're going to decorate this house. We're basically putting it together so that it can be auctioned off later. They understandably don't want anything to do with this house. They don't want the expenses that are going to go into fixing it up and they can't really rent it out because as is, it needs some major, major repair work and major deep, deep cleaning in order to make it safe and livable. The cleaning that you'll see us doing a little bit later makes it safe, but obviously we're not going to like replace a kitchen counter. On her top. Anyway, we'll get into all that here in just a bit. Okay, so let's talk about some things that we didn't do because God knows there are some commenters who love to point out things you didn't do. Isn't that right, Jeff? Jeff, we didn't sanitize the carpets or the beds. And that's kind of important to know because the beds were absolutely covered in mouse poop. I mean, the floors were too, but the beds were just covered in it. However, we didn't bother sanitizing those because one, it would have taken hours to do it. And two, the mattresses will be going no matter what. If the people who buy the house keep the bed frames, fine. 
fine, but I mean, everybody throws away the mattresses as well they should. I would have liked to have done the carpets, but that would have meant me bringing over my actual carpet cleaner, which would have added two to three days to the project. And after we had spent like seven days here, that's too much. We didn't have any more time than that. We cleaned the outside of the fridge, but I didn't do the stove or the inside of the fridge. And that's because both of those appliances are completely trashed. They're going to be removed. But I still wanted to see if I could get the fridge clean on the outside, so I did it just for the sake of the video. We didn't do any windows in here. Same reason windows take forever to do. We would have spent another full day in here just doing windows. I didn't clean the creature that lives under the bed because I tried to dust it and it was like, leave me alone. I was like, all right, chill, chill. Just be a creature. You just do you and exist amongst the beds. I'll be cleaning over here. Let's talk about some interesting things that we found in these bedrooms. I forgot to hit record as we were cleaning out the closet, but I found a stack of games, board games, kind of, that dated back to the 1940s and 1950s. Some of them were lawn games, like you played a tic-tac-toe sort of deal by throwing bean bags on it. Original box, none of the boxes were torn. I found a pendulum pool game from the 1950s. Old toy Vegas slots. Monopoly from, I'm thinking the Monopoly board was either the 60s or the 70s. Again, all pieces intact. All the boxes were in great condition. We found old sewing machines that came in their own cases from, I think, the 1940s, possibly even a bit earlier than that. This is where we found the Gucci bag and the Chanel bag. We found a Sega Genesis original, and then they made an upgrade called the Sega Genesis 16-bit. Those respectively typically sell from between $100 to $300 each under the right circumstances. We also found an original copy of NHL 95 with the original box, original instruction book, and there was like a poster of player stats in there as well. Those were in perfect condition, though the actual Segas themselves pretty badly needed cleaned up. I didn't do any of the cleaning on those. I'll leave that to the uh, professionals. We found at least 10 VCRs and DVD players, a bunch of original records, including 33 RPM and 45 RPM. We found a case of old perfect condition eight tracks, and one of the eight tracks that were in there was Robin Williams live in concert. We found two original Hot Wheels cases from either the late 70s or early 80s, and they had a little bit of yellowing, but it's extremely rare to find those because that plastic eventually becomes brittle. But because these were kept under beds and in toy boxes, they didn't really have the room to oxidize, so they're still in pretty good condition. We also found a ton of Hot Wheels to go with those, including some from the early 80s that were still in the package. We found original artwork from the Disney movie Bambi and an old zoning map for one of the surrounding towns that showed how they were going to lay out the town as they were building it. And then what I would assume to be several hundred, possibly a couple thousand dollars worth of old original Pyrex. Those appear to be from the 1960s. Now, looking at all this kind of tells me a story. All of the expensive stuff that they owned were from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. After the 1980s, you see a drop off in the type of stuff that they were buying. I know that the father in this situation had passed away a long time ago, and that was a major trigger for her hoarding disorder, but I'm assuming that that's also where they started to hit some financial hardships, because a lot of the new stuff that I was finding, kitchen gadgets or whatnot that were still in the box, were all things that were on sale, whereas the old part of their hoard that were more like antiques, those were all new stuff at the time that were super high quality. Unless somebody had come in and gotten the expensive jewelry, all of her jewelry was fake. It was mostly costume jewelry, but I didn't really find anything that would have been worth more than say like 50 bucks. All of the new clothing that still had tags on it were all stuff that she found on sale or in bulk. All of her wooden furniture matched in grain and color and texture. So you can tell they were bought as a set at one point, but they were really old, so she had never upgraded that furniture or never bought new furniture to go with the old furniture. So when you put all that stuff together, especially as you're going down through the layer and layer of hoarding, what you see is the stuff on the bottom, which is the stuff they had in the past, showed like an upper middle class living. And then as you got taller and taller into the hoard where they got have all their new stuff, that shows frugal spending, but still spending. So you can see an upper middle class living and then all all of a sudden the bottom drops out of that income, but she still can't cut herself off from buying new stuff. She just has to buy 
cheaper stuff because she can't afford it. This bedroom was absolutely exhausting because we had so many tiny things to go through and there was so much Christmas decorations in here and in the closet. And keep in mind, we still haven't started cleaning yet. This is all just sorting out the junk from the keep stuff. Most of what you're seeing in this house is going to a dumpster, like 90% of it. Meanwhile, we're taking all the stuff that can be used or saved into the living room and making a giant pile. And that's kind of using a uh, method that I normally use in a kitchen or a dining room where I'm going to move all the stuff that we're going to keep and utilize into one gigantic pile off to the side. Then throwing away all the stuff that's just in the way and not usable. Then we clean all the surfaces and then redecorate those with the things that we're going to keep. Except we're just doing this one on a much larger scale. Instead of doing it just in the kitchen first, then in the dining room, we're doing it with the whole house all at once. Now one of the things that I found really interesting about this house is that we didn't encounter a lot of trash. Yeah, there was a lot of junk, but normally in a house that's this hoarded, there's a bunch of like paper plates and pop bottles and empty bags and, and napkins and paper towels everywhere. Wrappers from food. This just didn't have that. Everything that we picked up had some sort of theoretical use, some sort of potential. It's just that in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't worth keeping or it couldn't be resold. It couldn't be donated. It was only garbage from our perspective. But that's really rare in my experience to come into a hoarder house, especially one that's this severe, and not find actual legitimate real trash everywhere. The closest we came to finding that was in the utility room, and that was mainly just because the mice and rats had gotten into it and shredded all the bags and boxes. Once we got everything off the floor, once we got all the trash out and everything thrown into a dumpster, the floors were so bad that we had to clean those in three stages. We had to pick up all the large objects by hand, so little pieces of cardboard and things that were too big for a shop vac hose. Then we had to use the shop vac to get the next size pieces off, so cotton balls and, and little small things that would destroy a regular vacuum. Then after that was done, we could switch back to an actual regular vacuum and vacuum it like normal. But even after all that, we still had to do one final vacuum in every room before we left. So while Adrian is doing that, which I told her, you grab this vacuum and you vacuum the floor. And I mean, now you do it now. And she started crying. I'm like, don't, don't cry. You just vacuum the floor woman. I, I don't know why I added the woman part. I think that's just a product of where I grew up. So anyway, after she punched me in the face, she went ahead and did that. Meanwhile, Daniel's in the background wiping down this really nice dresser. And both he and Jason ended up doing the same thing, which I think is hilarious. And I'm never going to let them live it down. Both of them separately in separate rooms, cleaned all the surfaces of the important parts of the room and then Swiffer dusted around it. So like Daniel did this dresser, then Swiffered the top of it and the ceiling fan and covered the entire thing in dust. So he had to start all over again. Jason did the same thing in the bathroom. You'll see that here in a little while. But with Daniel, it didn't matter quite as much because I had him use old English on all of the woodwork. So when you see him going over this for a second time, that's the old English polish. And you'll notice that that makes everything just glow. I really love that stuff. Old English and liquid gold are both amazing wood polishes. Now, this is a rare case where we're using APC on wood. So let me explain a couple things. For new viewers, APC stands for All Purpose Cleaner. It's a homemade solution that we make that boils down to 70% alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, and five or six drops of Dawn dish soap. We make ours with 91% alcohol, and then we dilute that down with water. We dilute it down to 70%. The only reason we do it that way is because we use a lot of it and that saves us space. So instead of having 10 bottles of 70% alcohol, we have six or seven bottles of 91%. But anyway, that stuff is really good for mirrors, glass, granite countertops, marble, just any type of high gloss or shiny hard surfaces. But it's not good on wood. And the reason is because it's since it's alcohol, it can strip or dull the finish. The only reason we're using that on woodwork here is because everything in the house was covered in roach poop. It had a massive roach infestation. So I would rather take a bit of a chance of it dulling the finish on a wooden dresser than to leave open exposed roach and mouse poop on every piece of furniture. Now typically that only dulls finish if you use a bunch of it and you let it sit on there 
there for a while. So using it one time on furniture like this wasn't a big deal. But I would still suggest to you to not use APC on woodwork. This is just a special circumstance in which it called for it. Normally what I do to get all that waste off would be just be to flex at it and it would just shoot off of there like a poop geyser. A geyser made of poop. A poop storm if you will. But at this point in the cleaning I was absolutely exhausted just from carrying all the books and magazines and all the heavy stuff that we've been doing over the last three days leading up to this point. So instead I got APC. We're actually closing in on wrapping up all these floors and then we'll get into the actual cleaning part. I did want to point out briefly that Adri did break the shop vac. Not really though. She just got a couple of chunks of things in the hose and it got stuck and we ended up goofing around with that for 10 minutes trying to unclog it. Daniel saved the day by finding a wire hanger that I could unspool and just jam down in there until everything loosened up. Kind of like post 10 taking apart a beaver dam except inside of a shop vac hose. This will also be one of the last videos that you see Adrian at least for a while. I, so I call her Adri. Her name's Adrian but we all call her Adri for short. She is going to college and she got just a small part-time job as a server and a host at a little restaurant closer to college. She was considering doing part-time work for us but this is not really a part-time type of thing. I need people there five days a week and she's not able to do that so she she's getting ready to move on. Now I told her college is a lot of work and she needs to do a job that she only does occasionally so she doesn't get wrapped up in the job over college. So I suggested that she either become a UFC fighter or a pro wrestler because at least then you're only working a few days per week at, at most like in UFC maybe one fight a month or two. And she chose the restaurant instead but like I told her you can still fight in those restaurants. You can still do UFC stuff. It's just your opponent's not expecting it and you won't get paid for it. So we'll see. We'll see what she chooses. This kitchen was a nightmare. It had so many roach bodies in the cabinets. So I had to take a shop vac and suck out all the dead roaches. Then they had that sort of rubbery contact paper stuff that you put on cabinets as a liner. And then you can set dishes on top of those without them pressing into the paint. And I don't know, they're supposed to make everything cleaner, but these just absorbed all the filth. So I had to pull all of those out, vacuum all the counters and cabinets. Then I sprayed everything down with Lysol and I sprayed so much of the kitchen down, we actually got a pump up sprayer, mixed up Lysol at 10 times its normal strength. For those of you in not America places, Lysol is concentrated. So whenever you mix it, we dilute that with water. And a lot of times it's just basically like a splash of Lysol and then fill an entire two gallon bucket of water. And that's what you clean with. So to make it 10 times stronger, we just add 10 times more concentrated Lysol. I pump up sprayed the entire kitchen, every cabinet, every every countertop, every surface. I even sprayed the outlets, which is a dumb idea, but I didn't care. I just swooshed across them real quick because Lysol is very good at sanitizing and killing germs. We did this with every room that had a non-carpeted floor. Then after it sprayed, we just walk away for like 15 to 20 minutes to let Lysol do its thing and let it kill any residual germs and bacteria that may be left on the surfaces. Now, this is not great for cleaning. It's good for killing germs, but it doesn't even touch Mr. Clean's Clean Freak. That stuff works 10 to 20 times better and faster than Lysol. So I'm only using this to saturate everything to kill off any baddies. Then I'm going to switch to Mr. Clean to get the actual grime and crud off. And that's basically the one-two punch that we used on everything, including the floors. And to answer the most important question people are going to have in the video, yes, those were bright orange boxers with little fire trucks on them. But the fire trucks aren't real. That would crush me. Those are little drawings, little cartoon fire trucks on my boxers. Also, those aren't real boxers because real boxers would punch me. They're, they're just called boxers. That's what they call the underwear.
Let's talk about some news real quick. I had a meeting with a large social media company today, and we're going to go ahead and start up a legitimate Facebook page for this channel. There's a few reasons for that. One, it's the same social media company that Ari Katarina uses. I briefly talked to her over email, and she loves what they're doing for her. And right now, we've got multiple people who have been stealing my videos forever and just posting them on Facebook as if they were their own. And at least one of them has made a substantial following of 100,000 subscribers on Facebook, this company will legally take care of that. Also, the current Facebook page that I have is my business Facebook. So when people message me on there and say, hey, can you come clean my house in Italy or whatever, that dings me and all of my employees and it disrupts my business. So I desperately need a Facebook page that is more channel centered rather than business centered. It's actually super disruptive whenever people message me on Facebook book about channel stuff. So when that new page gets up, I'll announce it here. I will promote it over and over and over again until people get used to going there. I'll also put it as the link in my about page here on YouTube so that people know they're going to the right one. Also, if you weren't aware, Insider's version of the collaboration that I did with uh, myself, Clean with Barbie, and A Beautiful Mess is now up on the Insider channel. I'll post a link to that in the description. And they've also contacted me about possibly doing some more work with me. And we'll see how that goes because I want to see how things work out with this Facebook management company first. If you've ever wondered about our membership area, I now have three tiers to choose from. I've got a low tier at like $1.99, which just gets you access to our Discord channel. And that's just for people who want to throw a couple bucks at us to help financially support what we're doing here on the channel. Our regular tier is $4.99 a month, and that gets you access to Discord and an extra video per week every Wednesday. Then, and only because I was asked to do this, I created a $25 tier for people who had the extra money to support the channel in a larger way, but I don't like doing that kind of stuff without giving something back. So people in that tier can watch live streams of me cleaning the houses that I film. So like this video that you're seeing right here today, my $25 tier members got to see that happen live. And basically, I just turn on a camera and start doing my things. I stop in occasionally to kind of shoot the breeze with the people who are watching and then I just go right back to work. So those streams can last for, you know, four, five, eight hours. But before you do anything like that, please, please, please don't do something like that unless you genuinely have the money to spend on it. I don't want anybody going broke trying to help out a channel that's already doing well financially. If I didn't have the $3,000 to pay for this cleanup, I would not have done it. But yes, that adds up pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, if if you can't afford it, that's great. If you can't afford it, you're, it's not like a slight on the channel. Though I will hate you forever. And there's that. I'll find out who you are personally. And I'll be like, you're the, you're the dude who's not paying for a membership, right? And then before you can even answer, you get spin kicked right in the face, son. Right in the neck. You'd be like, man, I thought that was a spin kick Johnny, but I didn't know until I got it. And then while you're thinking that, another spin kick. All right, back to the cleaning part. There's one thing that I wanted to point out because I get asked this a lot. How do you clean white painted uh, cabinets? Or how do you clean the grease off of the stove hood? This kitchen was completely covered in grease. Everything had a thick layer of grease on it, especially the stove and the refrigerator. The only thing I use to get that stuff off is straight Mr. Clean, undiluted, and a scouring pad. That's it. I spray it on the surface. If it's got a bunch of grease, like really thick grease, I just walk away for about 10 minutes, come back and spray it again if it's dried out at all, and then just go to town on it with that scouring pad. This worked so well on the hood of this stove that whenever I took my first swipe across, it peeled off like it was the plastic on the front of a TV. It just peeled. It was so weird and so gross and so satisfying at the same time. But it's also really good for those little black dots that you're seeing everywhere on the cabinets. That's roach poop. Some of it's fly vomit, but most of it's roach poop. Again, just spray it on walk away for a few minutes, come back with a scouring pad, and all that stuff disappears. Oh, hey, wait, more news real quick. So you shut up and listen. Listen. I finally bought all the cleaning supplies to start actually selling the things that 
I use in these videos. We're working on putting the website together and then we're gonna give the business a test run through the member section only. They'll get access to that website and be able to order from it just as a test run to make sure that all the shipping prices are correct, that the shipping speed is good, that they don't get things that they didn't order and that we just don't screw it up because all this is gonna be done by hand. It's gonna come directly from us, not from Amazon, not from drop shipping. It's all gonna be packaged up and sent by us. Once we give that a few weeks on the member section to make sure that it works, then we're gonna announce that here on the main channel and open that up to the public. So if you're a fan of people like Detail Geek or even Ari Katarina to a certain extent, we're gonna operate much like he does, where he uses the actual products in order to clean the cars and detail the cars. And then he'll just let you know, here's what I'm using, here's where you can find it and it doesn't turn into a big old infomercial because I don't want to do a channel that's just a big infomercial QVC type of bull crap bull poop Boop. I just want to be like him where it's like here's the stuff I'm using here's where you can find it now back to scrubbing mouse turds another question that I get all the time that I finally went to answer on this one did you pull out the fridge and did you pull out the stove to clean underneath them I pulled out the stove there was nothing underneath it no grease no staining no debris to sweep up it looked like brand new floor that had been preserved by a giant rectangle which was pretty much what it was the fridge did have some stuff around it so i'd say about three inches in but it was a case where i scooted it over swept and mop scooted it back swept and mop centered it but again it doesn't matter because both of these things are going to be pulled and tossed regardless but yes overall you'll be happy to know i did move those th those things at least a little bit to see if it was uh, a big freaking nightmare underneath them and fortunately Unfortunately, it was not, so suck it. The bathroom was done in a way that I probably wouldn't have done it in a normal house, but it kind of had to be. So first we sprayed the entire thing down with Lysol for the same reason that we sprayed down the kitchen. We wanted to kill all the, the nasty stuff. You know, all the germs, the bacteria, roaming demons, stray moose. Then afterwards, Jason's going to wipe everything up with a rag. And that's because he's going to be using things like Barkeeper's Friend and other chemicals that we don't know how it reacts with the chemicals that we're using. I'm mentioning it because it seems counterintuitive. It feels like you're cleaning one way and then didn't get it good enough so you had to clean another way. That's not what's actually going on here. We're basically making it safe enough to clean then cleaning it. This is also the room where he wiped everything up like that and then dusted off the lights and the medicine cabinets and stuff and just shot dust everywhere. He just dust geysered the whole room because that's how Jason rolls, son. Walks into a room and then just straight up filth guy. Geysers. Like, yo, man, is that old filth geyser? Hell yeah, it is. Calls him Geyser So Say down in Jacksonville. Let's go say hi to him at Wait, where'd he go? Also keep in mind the toilet didn't actually need much. I soaked that in toilet cleaner the very first day that we got there and we didn't actually have water for the first three or four days that we cleaned. So it was just raw toilet cleaner sitting on a very messed up toilet and I didn't record any of it. Every day that I came back, I put another layer of toilet cleaner on it. So by the time they finally got the water turned on, the toilet was basically clean without even any scrubbing or anything. So basically Jason's just gonna lie saw it and then follow it all up with Mr. Clean.
I will admit the way he mops the floor is interesting. I'm actually fine with how he did it all the way through because it did work. It's just he was stepping on areas that he'd already mopped. But I did have to go through and do one final mop on every floor. And then I did it properly where I started at the back of the room and then mopped backwards all the way out so that I'm not stepping on floor that I've already cleaned. But an interesting note here, notice how dull that bathroom floor is right now. Whenever you see the after picture, at the very end of this video, understand that's not wet. The after picture was actually taken like two days after he mopped this floor. It's completely bone dry, but it's so clean and so good that it looks wet. You can make your own mom joke there if you want. I'm a gentleman and would never do that. Once Jason finished with the bathroom, I had him knock out the hallway, which was a good idea because he ended up getting sick the next morning. We have like a flu slash cold thing going around. We do have COVID making its way through town again too, but he woke up sick and couldn't help me on the, the very last day that I was cleaning there, which was fine because I'm kind of bouncing everywhere on this day anyway. And really on this last day, the only thing I had left was to cap off a couple of floors. I needed to take all the stuff that we had in the living room that had accumulated and put it back in their respective rooms and use it as decoration and then put other things that are going to be personal items to be be saved into specific closets. So like the collections of all the, the really expensive old antique vintage games, those all went in their own closet. All the pictures and personal items went in another closet in another room. All the old school like antiques that weren't toys went in their own closet in a third room. And I did that to make it way easier for the son to figure out what he had and for him to sort through that stuff on his own. Then any remaining items that don't get put away are to be used as decoration. So from the living room, I would take all of the pots, pans, dishes, kitchen gadgets, electronics, and I would find cabinets to put those into as if she was still living there. Then any decorative vases, colored glass, anything that had value that was decorative, I just redecorated the living room and a couple of bedrooms with that. And I did that until every item was out of the living room and put in its place. And that finally let me have a clear floor where I could get everything vacuumed up and ready to go. After that, it's just a matter of redecorating the kitchen, packing up my car, and then going home to play an evil playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. I can tell you honestly, there isn't a hoarder cleanup on this channel that made me more excited to post than this. And I think it's because the transformation is a 100% transformation. The hoard was removed in its entirety rather than having to compromise on what we kept and threw away. And I didn't have to restack a whole bunch of stuff that was useless because the person who has hoarding disorder wasn't ready to let it go. The transformation is so complete that I felt proud and I don't allow myself to feel pride very very often, but I'm proud of this one. This was worth every penny that I paid for it just because I get to see that guy on Saturday and walk him through everything we did, and I cannot wait to see his reaction and to know this is something he doesn't have on his plate anymore. He doesn't have to worry about any of this. I will never directly ask you to become a member. I only just tell you what's there, and then it's up to you if you want to become one or not. I will never ask for a donation. I'll never do Patreon. I'll never do Venmo, PayPal, Cash app, any of that stuff. I don't take donations. The only thing I ask of you is to please hit the subscribe button. There's one thing I want from this channel, and that's a gold plaque. We already had the silver one that we got from 100,000 subscribers. Right now, as of this recording, we're at 312,000. When we hit a million, we get a gold plaque, and that's the only thing I want if there's to be like a return on what I do. Or you could just not do that and be the devil worshiper that you are. I mean, that's what devil worshiper do. They don't subscribe to things. So it's your life, man. You want to worship the devil and not subscribe. That's your thing. Anyway, we always do a Monday live. So keep your eyes open for that. Members, I will see you this Wednesday with your members only video because you're better than everybody else.
Mm-hmm. And if you don't partake in either of those things, no big deal. I will see you next weekend. Later. Later.